On November 3rd, 1874, Captain A.S. Daggett of the 2nd U.S. Infantry sat at his hotel window and watched horrified as bloodshed ensued outside the polls on the main street of Eufaula, Alabama on Election Day. An altercation outside a polling station between black Republican, Miles Lawrence, and white Democrat, Charles E. Goodwin, quickly turned into a massacre after Lawrence was stabbed in the shoulder by Goodwin's companion, William Dowdy. Prepared for conflict, unofficial white militiamen shouted, Fall into Company A! Fall into Company B! and began firing an estimated 500 shots into the mass of unarmed black men on the street. When the dust had settled, 75 men were found wounded and 7 dead. More life was lost later that night in the neighboring town of Spring Hills when Democrat intruders broke into the house of Republican city court judge Elias Hills and opened fire, killing his 16-year-old son, Willie. Overshadowed by the carnage of that day was the large-scale destruction of ballot boxes, the theft and burning of hundreds of casted ballots, as well as the denial of thousands of black men from the polls. Democrats swept the county elections, and symbolic of the rest of the nation had a new party representing their district in the House of Representatives for the first time since the Civil War. In the summer prior to the Election Day violence, racial and political tensions in Ifala had reached its climax, as white conservatives hoped desperately to redeem political control from the Republican coalition of carpetbaggers, scalawags, and enfranchised blacks. To Democrats' dismay, local elections often resulted in Republican victories, their current representative in Congress a leading black politician, James Rapier. Rapier, born free in the slaveholding South in 1837, won his seat in December of 1873 and worked hard during his tenure in the defense of black rights. In his first address to Congress, Rapier reaffirmed this stance as he proclaimed, I cannot willingly accept anything less than my full measure of rights as a man, because I am unwilling to present myself as a candidate for any brand of inferiority. Consequently, Alabama's white conservatives were determined to win the November congressional election, and in June of 1874, at the state convention, Democrats nominated former Confederate Jeremiah Williams for the second Alabama congressional seat and adopted the Pike County platform. In essence, the platform encouraged the ostracism of white Republicans in hopes that they could alter their voting behavior or force them to move. Later that summer, local Democrats took more extreme measures to defeat the Republicans when they formed the White Man's Club of Eufaula. Similar to the white supremacist Ku Klux Klan, members of the organization attempted to force local black voters to pledge loyalty to the Democratic Party. City Court Judge Elias Keels recognized the growing tensions, and in the weeks leading up to the election, reached out to government officials seeking support and protection. Finally, less than two weeks before the election, a U.S. Marshal answered his pleas and a company of soldiers led by Captain A.S. Daggett was sent to oversee the election. However, just as the soldiers from the U.S. 2nd Infantry arrived in Barber County, their ability to aid the election was severely restricted by General Order No. 75. General Erwin McDowell, commander of the Department of the South and Captain Daggett's superior, gave the order, limiting uses for Army troops to enforce writs of U.S. courts and to protect Internal Revenue Department agents. Despite Captain Daggett's protests, he and his troops were essentially powerless, and Keels and the Republican Party were forced to proceed with the election unprotected. Despite the lack of protection, black voters were prepared to use strength in numbers, and the night before the election, hundreds gathered on the outskirts of Eufaula to prepare for Election Day. Republican leaders George H. Williams, Henry Frazier, and Edward Odom organized voters, handed out Republican ballots, and gave orders to travel unarmed on their march to the polls to avoid the slightest excuse for white violence. On the morning of November 3rd, an estimated 1,500 men marched into the town, ready to cast their votes. Throughout the morning, blacks and whites, Republicans and Democrats, cast their votes peacefully. However, at 1 o'clock, Miles Lawrence's and Charles Goodwin's paths crossed as Goodwin and his fellow Democrats attempted to force an underage black boy to vote the Democratic ticket. Once the first gunshot sounded, white men ran to their predetermined stations on either side of the street and to second floor shops above. After about one minute and an estimated 500 gunshots, with the attack laying in the street, former Confederate Brigadier General Alpheus Baker yelled with the rest of the men, Let the Yankees come. We are ready for them. The violence and destruction in Eufaula on November 3rd kept many blacks and Republicans from the polls, and hundreds of casted ballots for the Republican ticket were destroyed. In the end, the Alabama 2nd Congressional District went to the Democrats as Jeremiah Williams won the election by 1,056 votes and took his seat at the House of Representatives. After an unsuccessful appeal over the validity of the election, James Rapier was forced to forfeit his position and the election of Williams was confirmed. Although violence like that of Eufaula was not a commonplace in the 1874 election, the electoral outcome held true throughout the nation. 
94 Democratic congressional candidates around the country beat out their Republican adversaries in 1874 and took a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time since the Civil War. The election marked a success for the Democratic Party, not only in congressional seats, but in their newfound ability to control the black vote. While Republicans maintained control over the presidency and the Senate, the midterm election of 1874 made clear that control over the South was slipping. The election signaled that with little to no federal oversight, southern state and local governments had free reign over elections and could implement policies to nullify the designed effects of the 14th and 15th Amendments. 1874 marked the beginning of the end of the black right to vote in the South, a right that would take almost a century to recover.